Welcome to today's colloquium. Uh, this is the first colloquium talk of the year. So it's an honor for us to have Dr. Luo Pei Lin from IAMS. Um, it's interesting how I met Dr. Luo. <laughs> In our open house last October, uh, you know our open house, right? In Nankang. And we have uh, many different activities. One of them is called Ask an Astronomer. So each of us sat uh, with a group of like high school or even elementary school students, and they can ask us astronomical questions. So in my table, there are several young students. I talk to them. One of them asked me some astronomical questions about how to use spectroscopy on astronomy. That student asked brilliant questions, much deeper questions than the other high school students. I thought, wow, that's great. I hope this student can go to the physics department, study physics, or study fundamental science. After that, after the session, I became free, I walked around, I went to the booth of other institutes, including the booth of IAMS, and I encountered that student again. So I talked to that student. And then I realized, no, this is not a high school student. It's a research fellow. This is how I met Dr. Lo. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and the reason she talked to me or, or came to our booth is because she wants to know how astronomy, how astronomers use spectrum. Um, so, <laughs> that's how I know her. So I invited her to come here to give a talk so our people can know her more and maybe in future we can collaborate. So Dr. Luo got her uh, PhD degree in 2014 from National Tsinghua University from the Institute of Optoelectronics. Uh, photonics. Photonics. And then she went to uh, Tsinghua University, Max Planck Institute, and Zhongdong University for postdoctoral research. Then from 2018, she became a assistant research fellow of IAMS. So she works on a, a laser spectroscopy of, from uh, Kong. And she's also interested in how to apply this spectroscopical technique on other science, like atmospheric science, and today, she wants to know if there is any way to apply her work on astronomy. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Luo. Thank you. Yes. So yeah, thank you very nice introduction. Actually, I sometimes I'm very sensitive with the spectroscopy so I walk around and I just heard okay spectroscopy and um, because in that time only two, stu two students sit with Dr. Wang so I think I can join them <laughs> yeah it's a story okay so today I would like to show you share some information about uh, our recent work so today topic I will talk about high resolution meaning our time result dual cost to transcopy. So I hope in this talk you can learn why is optical frequency cone and uh, how can we use the frequency cone to do the spectroscopy. Okay, here's the online. First I because here uh, a little bit focus on the meaning virus, so I will a little bit talk about the meaning virus spectroscopy, then I will talk some uh, introduction and the principle of optical frequency cone and the direct cone spectroscopy. Then I will show you uh, our highly flexible meeting our dual cone spectrometer in my group. And uh, we use this system to study the high resolution, high result dual cone spectroscopy. For now, uh, our research topic particularly focuses on studying the multiple transient molecule, which is the molecule is unstable. Okay, and uh, we also can study some chemical reaction. Finally, I will give summary and outlook. Okay, so in the meeting environment, sometimes we we call this range is the molecular fingerprint range. 
The reason is you can find many molecules has very strong fundamental vibration mode in media environment. So if today you prove the molecule by using a media infrared source, it means you can get a lot better sensitivity. Another way, uh, you can also use the media infrared spectroscopy to identify different molecules with different vibration mode. So that's a reason it's just like our fingerprint. People can use the media infrared to do those regular fingerprinting. And uh, here, sometimes, uh, even I have the class that I want to tell students, the unique is very important because uh, people in different fields, they prefer to use the different unique for the spectral measurement. So for example, uh, if people work on the photonics, they like to use the nanometer. And uh, if people in the chemistry, they like to use the wave number. And uh, in physics, people like to use the curves. So here's the common sense. You must need to know one wave number equal to around 30 gigahertz. It's the common sense you, you can like a take home message, okay? It's not too difficult. So up to now, the, the mini infrared spectroscopy have been used in many different fields. It can uh, apply to environmental tracing, remote sensing. Of course, it can also do the space sensing. And in the lab study, we can use the mini infrared spectroscopy for study the chemical dynamic creation mechanism and the molecular structure. So here, for example, for now, there are two types of the space the telescope. They are also focused on the measurement for the spectroscopy and image in the linear infrared over the mid infrared. So you can see here is the mid infrared spectrum take from the black hole. Okay. And uh, up to now, the most widely used instrument for the mid infrared spectroscopy is the uh, Magnuson Experiment Fast FTIR. So sometimes we call the FTIR is the bridge from spectrometer. I think, uh, can I ask a question? Did anyone know who has the Microsoft interferometer? Please write your hand. Okay, good, very good. So I think anyone knows uh, why is the Microsoft interferometer, which is use the Doppler effect to, down, to let the laser light frequency down conversion by a filter around 10 to the power of 6. So in this case, you can use the common photo detector to measure the signal at the around radio frequency domain. And then here you can get the experiment, which is a one, one, one beam goes to the this needle, another beam go, go to the moving needle, then you can change the optical delay. So in this case, you can measure the experiment on a high scale. And if you do the free transform of this time domain is broken, then you can get the spectrum in a frequency domain. So it's the free transform. However, here for the conventional FTIR, there are several limitations or challenges. Here is a, the first thing is it, it is sometimes if you want to re, uh, measure the high resolution spectrum, the first thing you may need very long optical delay. So for example, if you require the resolution down to 10 to the power of minus three wave number, it's around 30 megahertz. So in this case, you need 10 meter optical delay text. So it's very huge. So in other things, uh, the measurement time is also very long. It's sometimes you may need several hours even for a few days. So in addition for the FTIR, because a conventional FTIR is used the thermal light source just like our, a little bit like our light bubble. So it's not a coherent light source. So it means it has some limitation for several kilometer paths, as well as there are some huge uncertainty for the concentration measure. Therefore, People, of course, we will think about is, is any possibility to have other new approach which enable to achieve high resolution and high sensitivity. 
And we also want the program management. Maybe we can have a real time efficiency and with much compact system. Okay, so that's why today I will talk about the optical frequency code and uh, how, how to use the optical frequency code to do the spectroscopy. Okay, so first I will tell you what is optical frequency code. So you can image. Today you have a cone. I think everyone uses a cone. I, I have checked all of you. You must use a cone every day, right? So you can think about you have a cone and then you put this cone in a frequency domain. So there are two important parameters. One is the distance between the end of the cone, just, just the zero point to the first cone line. Here is the, what well, sometimes we call is the offset frequency. The second important parameter is the distance between the two cone tips. Here, just the spacing of each cone line. So today we can think about if we can well control these two parameters, then we can make this cone become a ruler. Okay, so today you, if we have a ruler, it, a very good ruler in a frequency domain, what we can do? Okay, if we have a ruler in a frequency domain, then of course we can measure the absolute frequency. The second is the frequency can be measured very accurately. Then what else? You can have high precision time, right? If the time can, can have very high precision, then of course we also can do the high resolution absolute distance measurement. Okay, so how to generate the optical frequency cone in a frequency domain? Here is also come from the flash of bones spectroscopy. It's not difficult to understand. Okay, if today you have a CW laser. Uh, it's just like a sine cosine wave. If you do the flash transformation, then in principle you will get the delta function. However, because all the laser have some uh, noise, so of course it's not like a uh, delta function. It's a little bit like a single function. Okay. And let's see if we consider we have a cross laser. Cross laser is means actually the light source include many different color uh, electromagnetic wave. So if we do the motion phone, it actually in a fixed domain is like a broadband light source. Then we can start because optical frequency cone usually it, it should be a broadband light source. So we can think about the the first thing we can think about from the face if. Uh, for example, here should show a different color EM wave. So if for the first case, if all the face they are rendered, then eventually you, you can get the, just a random face like, like a light bubble. But if just a, at a very, very short time, all of the face for the different EM wave, they can infect. In this case, sometimes we, we call it more luck. So it, in this case, if we can let all of the wave they are in phase at a very short time, then we can get a molar laser, and the, in a time domain, it's just like we have a ultra short laser curve. Okay. Sometimes, if, if uh, for for now, you you can very easy to buy a com commercial molar laser. So how about the molar laser? Okay, here it's much easier to understand. You have a different color wave, and just in very short time, if all of the phase are in phase, you can get a very uh, stronger infrared. And if we do the flash and bone of this molar laser, actually in a time domain, we just can get the optical frequency cone. Okay, so the distance between each cone line just the partition frequency of the molar laser. And here also have a uh, offset frequency. So if we can well control the F0 and the F repetition rate, actually this one just become a ruler in a frequency domain. So typically we will say, okay, the optical frequency cone have broad laser spectrum with many narrow, narrow combined. Okay. So up to now, the optical frequency cone 
can be generated by many different methods, just depending on what kind of the experimental purpose you want to, uh, you, you can build different type, type of optical pattern cone. And uh, the, depend, uh, depending on different experiments, we can also have the XUV cone and the Sarah cone. Okay, so for the first cone, it's made by the Mollock laser. It's a very huge system. And then now you can buy a commercial one, the, the size just like uh, your mobile phone. And now they have other technique which can generate the cone on a cheap size. And we can also have other uh, technique to generate different type of cone. Of course, the property will be different. Okay. So the second question is how to use the cone. So typically, they are two methods to use the optical focus cone. The first one we, we call the focus cone assisted laser spectroscopy. If today you more care about the position, the accuracy, and the stability, then people will use the cone like a wave meter. Okay, it's just like a ruler in a focus domain. We can lock the uh, one of the setup laser to the cone line, and we can scan the rotation ray then the stable laser can also move into major transition spectrum, something like this. And another thing is uh, in recent five to 10 years, which is much more popular in many, many different fields, which we call the direct focus cone spectroscopy. Because today you can think about you have a broken line source and uh, it, uh, it means it enable to do a broken measurement. It means sometimes we call it, you can do the multicolor spectral measurement or the multicolor image. In other sense, uh, if today you use the ultra fast broadband comb, then you have an uh, intense show laser purse. You can also do the broadband nonlinear spectroscopy, so, which is very useful in the material or biological application. Okay. And then I will show a few examples. For, for the first laser, as I mentioned, if it, today you want to measure the fundamental constant, absolute frequency, then people will use the optical frequency cone as a super good calibrator in the frequency domain. So for example, here they can measure the absolute transition, they can start with the red bird constant and the photo size. You can see all their system have one optical frequency cone as a very good frequency ruler. And people can also combine with the cone technique to get very good optical clock. For example, here, I see for now the uncertainty already down to 10 to the minus 90 to 20. It's very, very high accuracy. Okay, how about in a, in a space? So, uh, as in usually, uh, as in perhaps <laughs> Dr. Wong know better than me, so usually uh, here they will measure the Doppler shift. Okay, so for example, they w if they want to uh, after some stereo, then here is some the position they in, in the instrument is required. For example, here is less than 10 cent centimeters per second. And he also say it re requires stable for long time. It's like a stable year. However, for the commercial calibrator, there is uh, make the, the first thing is the resolution is not good enough. The second is the long term stability is also not available. So which which cause some limitation in the ultra observation. So here just for some quick calculation. So you can think about if today you require the velocity resolution is nine centimeter per second. Then you, you know the speed of the light is three times and to the power, 10 to the power of a meter per second. Then you will see the relative accuracy you, you are required is three times 10 to the power of minus 10. 
So here is some information for you. Just uh, in the next study, if people work in a major low frequency for some atomic transition, before people have the optical frequency cone, of course we have we, we can lock the laser to some atom or mark or molecular transition for the stabilization. But the relative accuracy is only 10 to the power of minus 5 to minus 8. Okay. But after people have the optical frequency cone, then typically the relative accuracy can very easy down to 10 to the power of minus 12. So that's the reason people work on the optical frequency cone will think about might be optical frequency cone can help to the uh, telescope uh, to become a much better calibrator. Okay, let me just show you an example. They already put the optical frequency cone in the telescope and uh, usually people call this type of cone is ultra cone. For the ultra for the ultra cone layer is one unique property is the frequency repetition rate usually is what on 10 to 50 gigahertz. Why they want to use this uh, 10 to 50 gigahertz repetition rate? The reason is because the spectrometer they can only the resolution not good to measure the the, for example, at the beginning, the optical frequency cone of the tutorial rate is 100 MHz. However, the spectrometer the resolution is not good enough to after the 100 MHz. So that's the reason. So now they, they just make the 10 to 50 gigahertz in order to let the spectrometer can measure the cone and the emission from the space simultaneously to do the calibration. Okay. So for now, they, they can uh, achieve the precision as low as this centimeter per second. So which is good enough to have to uh, to have to solve current issue. Okay. Okay. In other things, uh, uh, I think uh, today I will more focus on the direct frequency cone spectroscopy, and uh, for now. This technique can, can be used in very different fields. For example, people can use it to study the chemical reaction, can use it to do the remote sensing, and uh, it can also can be used to do some linear spectroscopy like the Dilkon cast, surface intense cast, or the hyperspectral image. So there are many different applications which we can use the direct cone spectroscopy. So up to now, here just show an uh, overview of the or application of the optical frequency cone. And uh, I think it's five years ago they already sent the third optical frequency cone to the space. So I, I think in the next generation space telescope, they may add the optical frequency cone in the telescope to in, improve the, the stability and the resolution. But today I will not talk about the story in the space, but I will talk about some story in our Earth's atmosphere. Here I will show you our recent work on high resolution medium infrared time result Dilkon spectroscopy for, in, for investigation of some key species and the reaction in atmospheric chemistry. Okay, so here just just quickly show you, so if today we want to study the direct cone spectroscopy, there are two methods to, to do. The first thing, you can use the single cone spectroscopy, but you both need to combine with the microscope parameter, or you, you can use the CCD uh, camera here, you can use some gradient to separate different wavelengths in different positions, then you use the CCD camera to measure it. However, because here it has some movie needle and the camera, also of the instrument will limit your measurement speed. So that's the reason for now people are more likely to use the Dilkon spectroscopy because all the Dilkon is means they have they are two frequency cone and you only need 
or only need one single photo detailer. So I will go through detail. So what is dual comb speed transfer? You can think about today you have a two comb and with slightly different repetition rate. Just here is the FR and here just slightly different repetition rate. So you can think about one of the comb passing through the cell carrying some information. At the left, it will overlap with the second comb to perform the multi heat dye interference. By right here, you can just use a common photo detector to measure the interferon. I'll show you here. Okay. So in, in a fixed domain, I, I think this, this picture is much easier to understand. You can think about, okay, the comb line is passing through the cell, so some of the comb line, the intensity is reduced because of the molecular absorption. After that, it can fit with the second comb to do the multi heat dye interference. It means we can do the focus down conversion from optical focus domain to the, to the radio focus domain. But the factor just the delta repetition rate over repetition rate. This, this factor is just around 10 to the power of 6. Okay, so that's the reason we can go, we, we can take the terahertz to the megahertz. So if today you have a signal, uh, with, with, with the frequency around tens or few hundred megahertz, it means you can much easier to find a photo detector to measure it. So actually, this eye comb just the free transformation of the measured interferon. So I, I think it's much easier to understand why is the dual comb speed transfer. Okay. okay. So here, be, because all of the spectrometer have some limitation. Of course, dual comb spectroscopy also have the limitation. Here is just the formula. All the case most need to obey this condition. The reason is you can think about the red cone and the, the blue light cone light because they are doing the multi heat dye interference. So if the the green light is in the center between the two red line, then after the beating, you you will get the same I come like in the same, same frequency. So in this case, we, we, we call it is the aliasing. Okay, so to avoid this effect, here just the uh, condition, here just the formulas, it means the different repetition rate most need to small than the, uh, here the repetition rate square over two times delta F. Delta F is the measurement span. So it means uh, they are both have a trade-off among spectrum resolution, spectrum coverage, and the temporal resolution. Okay. Okay, so after some introduction, then we can start to move to our next work, which we have established the highly flexible medium variable spectrometer. Here we didn't use the monarch laser. We use the electron optics moderator, that's the optical focus cone system. And this system is very compact, which can provide us high mutual coherence without any phase like electronics. And uh, we can also uh, achieve high resolution and the spectral, we get spectral measurement. And we can also can do the time result and the precision spectrum equation. Okay, so the system is much, much simple. You can think about, okay, we generate the optical frequency cone based on a CW laser. Just the CW laser can pass it through the EON to do the intensity modulation. After the intensity modulation, it will become a cone. Okay? After some optical amplify, because we want to generate the meaning variable, so we just combine with the different frequent generation technology. So here just the nonlinear crystal and then we just do a different frequent generation. So the mini barrier cone can be converted to mini barrier spectrum range. So he by using this technique is very compact. Although the spectrum bandwidth for the cone is relatively narrow, it's about two wave numbers like 60 gigahertz, but we have the broad with reference to the village, it's over 600 nanometer. So 
by using our system, we still can do the broadband measure just by tuning the center reference of the core. Okay. And the, the most important thing, this system has a unique advantage, is, which is it has widely and simply tunable conlife basis. Because if you remember, the, there is a trend of, of the spatial coverage temporary, temporary resolution and the spatial resolution. It means we can co widely control the spatial resolution and the temporary temporary resolution by using our system. Okay. Okay, here just to show, show you the entire, entire system feature. <coughs> the first thing we can generate to meaning binary cone based on a single system laser with electron optical moderator. Then second one is we just uh, generate the meaning binary cone by different frequency generations so we can uh, let the linear infrared cone frequency convert it to the linear infrared spectrum region. Finally, we just do the very transform dual cone spectroscopy. And uh, with this system, the dual cone spectroscopy, we also can do the asymmetric or the symmetric system. It's just depending on today you only want to see the intensity or you want to see the phase spectrum or not. Okay. Okay, so here we can see here is our measure the dual cone in, in the program. You can see the red line is without the gas sample, and then the red line is with the gas sample. You will find a little bit different in the in the program, right? So after the transformation, we can see the common result spectrum as shown here. For some of the cone line are already be uh, the intensity is reduced due to the micro absorption. By using the dual cone, the common result dual cone spectroscopy there is a very unique advantage com companion with the con conventional FTIR, which is uh, for analyzing the, the common result spectrum, we only take the peak of each cone line uh, as the spectral setting point, which means we are able to uh, analyze the spectrum without the instrumental line shape. And uh, by using this way, we can do the position measurement, which means <coughs> if the absorption profile is Gaussian function or the void function, then we can uh, directly use the Gaussian or void to analyze the spectrum, and we can study the, uh, for example, like the pressure broadening coefficient, we can study the absolute line intensity or the absorption cross section by using our technique, okay. How long does it take to make such a measurement? Well, for this spectrum, few <coughs> milliseconds. Yeah. Total recording time just a few milliseconds. Sometimes if you want to do more averages, only a few hundred milliseconds, you can finish the experiment. Yes, so it's very fast. Okay, here okay, here you, you can see the spectrum. Each spectral measurement time is only 300 milliseconds. Okay. So for example, here is just show you the double limited resolution because here the pressure is about four tall. So typically you, you see the spectrum is the double limited resolution and we can compare with the database spectrum is is very agree with the database, and we also can do a broadband measurement, which can up to 600 wave number. It's around 600 nanometer. In addition, we also can determine the isotope abundance with the small than one percent uncertainty. So here shows a different isotope of N2O. Okay, so you can see different color just according to a different isotope. And uh, here is our experimental data and uh, hydrogen de the spectrum from our hydrogen database. And uh, our residual with the standard degradation is more than 1%. So it can, uh, by using the dual cone spectroscopy, which allow us to measure, the, the first thing is the concentration of the trans gas can be measured with much, much higher accuracy. 
even though they are several peaks, they are very close or overlap. So we have less good accuracy and the resolution. Okay. Okay, so the next part I think is most important. I think it's interesting. Uh, uh, for this part, I will talk about how we can use the optical frequency comb to do the time result measurement. And uh, we derived to use this technique to study some important chemical reactions. Okay, so first, so for here, the first session, I will quickly tell you how to use the dual comb to do the time result measurement. Okay, here's the experimental setup because today we want to see some theoretical in a chemical reaction. Okay, so here is our reaction chamber. We use the material type multiple cell. So here you can see the this bar in the mirror. So for this cell, we design 63 packs with a total panel test length of 41.8 meters. And the center, there's a hole. We, we have the photolysis laser go through the center to generate the theoretical in the system. And we can couple the medium infrared comb to the to this multi-pass cell. Okay. So for for achieve the time result measurement, here you can see we can continue to measure the dual cone interferometer. And the dual cone interferometer here, the distance between the two interferometer actually in a time domain is just one over different repetition rate. So for example, if today the different repetition rate is one megahertz, it means the this term, this delta t, is one microsecond. Okay. So how how, how we can do the time result measurement? We just can choose how many interferon we want to do the Fourier transformation to generate each ft spectrum. For example, if we take ten dual interferon, then it means the resolution is ten microseconds. Okay, so that's the reason if we have a raw data, then we can depend on different experimental conditions because sometimes we want to see the product. Then product is stable, it's not, it doesn't mean we need a very high temporal resolution. Sometimes we want to see the intermediate. If the, if the lifetime of the intermediate is only one microsec 100 microsecond, it means we most need to have at least 10 or 5 microseconds enable to see the intermediate. So by using this case, we, we can analyze our raw data by using different temporal resolution very easily. Okay. In addition, we also can tag the uh, spectrum before the photolysis, which is just the precursor spectrum. Then we can do a normalization to get the, the different absorbance spectrum by using this way. Okay. Okay, here you can see the time result your count spectrum in this relation. So here we just want to generate the actual to radical. So by using this relation actually we can see the actual to radical and the, the byproduct. Here is the formaldehyde. So compared with the actual to formaldehyde is quite stable. So you can see some some of the transitions decay very fast. It's below to actual two radical. And the sum of it's very flat is for multi So we can identify different molecules by using the first is the the low vibrational result spectrum. The second is their distinct they are this their different temporal behavior. Okay. In addition, we also can do the position measurement. For example, here we can increase the sampling point by just, we can measure this spectrum by using different repetition rate to increase the spectral resolution. And we can do a position measurement. For example, we can measure the pressure broadening coefficient. We can measure the absolute line intensity by using this way, even for the unstable mark. Okay, then here shows show the time trace of HO2 molecule, and we also can uh, change the 
resolution to see the signal-to-noise ratio. Typically, the, the spatial signal-to-noise ratio is proportional to the square root of the measurement time. If this is linear, sometimes we call it it's still co in a coherent average time. Okay. It means if you measure more, uh, use more measurement time, then the signal-to-noise ratio will continue increase. And here I just show you, for example, if today our resolution is 25 microseconds, then the minimum detector for, for actual to radical is of around 10 to the power of 11 micro per cubic centimeter. But if we a little bit use worse temporary resolution, temp, uh, temporary resolution actually the minimum detector for number density can down to 10 to the power of 10. Okay, just depending on what kind of the application, and we can choose the most suitable time resolution and the spectrum resolution. Okay, in addition, we, of course, we can do some uh, temporal variation. So, in this case, for example, if we put some NO into the reaction system, we, for this reaction, it can generate always radical and NO2. So in this case, we can, after here's two lines below to OH radical, so we can simultaneously monitor actual two for multi time OH radical. And then we also can see the spectrum of the precursor like method. Okay. So here just show you we, we can measure the radiation rate coefficient by using very complicated uh, model fitting. Okay. Then I will quickly show you our another work which we want to study the EO and the formation mechanism for OH and actual radical in a reaction involving the quitting medium. So it's like, like a, I see it's very interesting story in the atomic vehicle chemistry. So okay. So here for for this reaction cycle it's very important reaction in our atomic field. So here is the OH radical, HO2 radical, and the RO2 radical. So for this cycle, actually, which is tell us one ozone become two ozone. Okay, so this reaction is very important in the ozone formation. Okay. So in many countries, they all have some field measurement to continue monitor the concentration of OH and HO2 radical in our atomic sphere. But the, the story is, for example, here we can see in our atomic sphere, usually the OH radical are generated by, for example, the photolysis of ozone can generate OH radical. It means we most need to, if we, in the atomic sphere, if OH radical want to be generated, they are most need to have sunlight, okay? However, in some, for example, in UK, they just found, even in the night or in the winter, they still can monitor very high concentration of the OH radical. It means the field measurement is doesn't match with the chemistry modeling. So they almost have some reaction which can generate the OH radical, but don't need sunlight. So that's the reason, actually, in, I think it's quite early, in 1949, there is a researcher, he called, I think he's German, so it's rather for quickie, but in German it's called quich, okay, rather quich. So he just proposed there should be an intermediate, and this intermediate can be generated by ozonases of LK can generate this intermediate and this intermediate can directly form OH radical by using this pathway there is no need of the sunlight and uh, in the atomic field can directly generate OH radical okay but uh, you can see it's 1949 but in the atomic sphere, people cannot really observe the quick in the medium. The reason is the quick in the medium, the, the autonomous quick in the autonomous of alkene 
the formation of pretty in the medium, the formation rate is very slow, but this guy it can react away very fast. So it means in the atomic field, the steady state concentration of the pretty in the medium is very, very low. So that's the reason people cannot really measure the quickly in the medium in the atomic field. Until 2012, people found a chemical mix the chemical method which can generate a lot of quick in the media in the lab. So that's the reason people finally can confirm that. Okay, they already have some uh, molecule is the quick in the media, and uh, this quick in the media really can generate the OH radical in the lab study. They can prove it. Okay. So here's the in lab method. For example, the simplest quick in the medium is, is CH2 or O. Okay, in the last study, we can use the CH2I2 as a precursor. After laser photolysis, we can remove one I atom to generate a CH2I radical. And this radical can react with oxygen to form the simplest quick in the medium, just CH2OO is the simplest quick in the medium. And uh, this simplest quick in simplest quickie the media, part of, for example, in the low pressure condition below 10 to, about 80%, the quickie can be quenched down and uh, stabilized. For those, for, for those stabilized quickie in the media, medium, people can use it to study the, the infrared spectrum to, to, identify, to identify its molecular structure and also can study it. Uh, the reaction with other important atomic proteins. Another 20% may directly do isomerization and decomposition to form other small marsh. Okay, but here we still have one question is because we know the quick in the medium can form the OH radical. So of course we are curious is can we divide it? quantify the OH and the H2 radical form from the relation involving the quick in the medium. Can we the right major OH radical as well as the quick in the medium? So this is why I'm interested. Okay, in order to see the quick in the medium here, I just built another laser at the, at the micro. So I use this signal technique to, to build the vehicle spectrometer at the end micro. And here I just use the CH2I2 as a precursor. After photosynthesis, we can generate the CH2I radical, and this radical can react with oxygen to form the simplest quick in the medium. And the, the simplest quick in the medium can also do a self reaction to form the formaldehyde. So here's just show our time result dual conspecia. You can see here's the very quick decay. So here's the simplest quick in the medium and some, some line below to the formaldehyde. So we can observe the quick in the medium and the formaldehyde simultaneously. But uh, this is not enough because we want to see the OH radical. That's the reason we combine the three micron and the N micron together go through the reaction chamber. So in this case, we can simultaneously observe the simplest quick in the medium for Manihar, as well as the OH radical and the HO2 radical. Then we can directly know how much OH radical can be generated by the quick in the medium. Okay, so in addition, we also can obtain the absolute concentration by using the high resolution spectrum. Because today we can see the rotationally result high resolution spectrum, so we can do the absorption, do the integration of the absorption spectrum, and we have the line intensity over the absorption cross section. We know the absorption path, so we can just use the very easy the base low, then we can know the number density of each mark, right? So here we can just get the concentration profile of these four different species. Okay. For these four different species, the detection limit is can down to 10 to the power of 11 to 12 molecules per cubic centimeter.
which is good enough for for study the chemical reaction and the, to study the mechanism. Okay, after that we we can study to look at uh, this a little bit complicated a little bit complicated reaction mechanism. Okay, so we can think about okay today we we from the CH two I reaction with oxygen, which can form the simplest quick in the medium. Some of it will form CH two I rods to add up. And uh, because uh, after laser photolysis, it has been generated the CH two I radical with much higher energy. That's the reason we also will form the hot quick. It means this species has much more energy. So this kind of the quick in the medium will derive, will, will directly decompose to other products. For example, it will generate OH and the HCO radical. And the HCO radical will react with oxygen to form CO and the HO2 radical. Another thing is the stabilized quick in the medium, which can also go through the unimolecular decomposition. For the decomposition, it will also form OH and the HCO radical. So if we today we want to really know the OH radical is from the unimolecular decomposition or from the instant decomposition, we must need to have some different method to identify these two different pathways. So in order to distinguish these two formation pathway for the OH and HO2 radical here, we just put some SO2 into the reaction system. Because the quickie, the stabilized quick in the medium react with SO2, this reaction has been well studied. Okay? So if we put a lot of SO2, then most of the stabilized SO2, sorry, most of stabilized quick in the medium will react away by SO2. Then it will not go through unimolecular unimoric, decomposition. So it means if the system has a lot of SO2, then if we still can see OH and HO2 radical, then those radicals most generate from the instant decomposition of this hot quick in the medium. Okay, so by using this way, here's our experimental data. We, we can do the model fitting and the, uh, compare with the two cases just uh, with, with different concentration of SO2 without and with different concentration. And then by after analyzing those data, we can get some information. The first thing is at the low pressure condition, we can often the OH and HO2 radical with the about 2% and 6% of the initial concentration of the CH2 I radical. The second thing is those host radical in nearly 80% of total host radical will be generated from the instant decomposition of the energized quick in the medium. So the problem is the the 20%. So when, when we, okay, this is an interesting story. When we want to analyze the 20% hot radical, at the beginning we, we think the 20% maybe is come from the building molecular decomposition of the stabilized quick in the medium. But if it, it is true, then the decomposition rate is very fast. It's about few hundred per second. However, in the theoretical configuration, the unimolecular decomposition of the stabilized quick in the medium is super slow, which is smaller than one second, uh, one per second. So that's the reason uh, here we have some idea. Here is also our progress measurement, which is com compared with the hard band transition and the fundamental band transition. We found that you can see the orange lines of the hard band transition. So I think everyone now is the why is the hard band transition. Usually we, we say the fundamental band transition or the co-band transition is from the ground state. Ground state to exciting state is called the fundamental transition or the co-band transition. The hard band transition is means it from the exciting state 
to another static state, which we call a Hopin transition. Okay, so we can compare with the Hopin transition and the fundamental pain transition. For a Hopin transition, the rising and the decay are faster than the fundamental pain, which means they both have some quickie speed, the quickie immediate, not go to the growth state, but they can stable stay, stay in a one of the vibrational excited state. Okay, so those species may have much more fast unimolecular dissociation channel compared with the quickest species in the ground state. Okay, this is our hypothesis. Another thing is uh, another experiment that they, they just uh, after here we can see the here's the excitation energy and the dissociation rate. Even though the excitation energy is lower than the TS barrier, just the excitation energy is lower than the barrier, then the big immediate still can undergo dissociation due to the turn-on effect. Okay, so based on these two information, then we just have one idea, we just put the one species which we call the vibrationally exciting state quickie immediate. It means it's not in a growth state. It's a quick, the quickie in a first excited state. Okay. And uh, to, to do the kinetics model analysis. And uh, in this case, we also can get the branch ratio for these four different channels. So for here, we, we can find for the vibrational excited state of quickie immediate. It's about 10% of the vibrational code quickie immediate. And the interesting part is actually our result is also consistent with the microwave experiment. They here they, they also found a uh, remarkable excitation of the music mode here. For the music mode for the, in a quick in the media, it's just the first vibration on the excited state. Okay. And uh, you can see the intensity if the ground state is 100, then the music is 11. It's also about 10% of the ground state. Okay, so it's quite interesting. Okay, I think I'm almost finished. So, so finally, I give a summary and outlook. So, I hope uh, today you have heard about some our highly practical geocon spectrometer. For now, we have uh, three micron and micron and the one is a uh, four point six micrometer, which can use using for detect CO and uh, HCO radical. And uh, our system has widely and sim simply tunable coma spacing, which is very useful to optimize the time result during cross spectroscopy. And uh, we already use our new approach to study the precision spatial measurement of transient molecule. And we can also do a simultaneous determination of multiple region species, including the precursor, free radical, intermediate, and the end product. With this very uh, good Capability, we can start innovation communities and product you know, In the future, we are, we, we are also able to study some, uh, for example, like a radical reaction over the multi-phase relation. So, thank you for your attention. Uh, welcome, any questions? Okay, questions. The uh, astronomical uh, settings, the gas density or concentration are much lower. So, uh, can you this? Uh, let me say, I guess you have you, you mentioned about the sensitivity of your experiment. So, uh, can we actually use those simulated situation with combine with your spectroscopy measurements, or we have to, you know, how to say? Has those chemistry, but they extrapolate down to the astronomical uh, is, uh, environment. Yeah, so I think uh, for, for, for now, I'm using the multiply scale, but uh, actually the frequency comb can also can combine with the cavity. Mm -hmm. So if we have a cavity, do the cavity enhancement, then I think the number density can down to maybe 10 to the power. Nine, 
I think can can much improve about two to three order. I think which is impossible. That's that's limited by the intensity of the the light source itself, or what's the limitation? Um, for now, I think the best uh, capacity enhancement spectroscopy is. Uh, I think the, here is a se several issue. Sometimes we will call it called the figure of memory because you you can think about you have a detector. If the day you want to measure the broadband, it means you have a different color photo of the the right to go to the detector. It means today you if you want to get the broadband, of course the noise will much higher compared with the single color laser. So this is the first thing. The second thing is, uh, for now people can couple the the cone to the capi nano, but, but the nano also have some problem of the dispersion. If, if today you are using the broken laser light source, so it will also a little bit reduce the performance of the capi enhancement. But uh, I think in the future it can be slowly improvement. For example, now we are studying the. Uh, for example, like OH radical and HO2 radical in the atomic field, the OH radical the concentration, the number density is about 10 to the 6. So, you know, you can see now I can only go to the 10 to the 12. So, some improvement we are still trying to push. In the future, we hope we can directly monitor some theoretical in the atomic theater, yeah, so. It's not really, um, I mean, it's a technical question. Yeah. I'm curious about your frequency comb, how much it costs? <laughs> right. <laughs> how much it costs? De depends, depends. Okay, so you can think about, for, for now, I, I using the uh, EON cone is generated by a single CW laser with electron optical modulator. The most important thing, uh, I think the, this system is much, much cheaper than you use the monarch laser cone because CW laser, EON modulator, and uh, one pulse generator. So compared with the monarch laser, it's much cheaper. So because I, I'm asking because we are more interested about the clock, optic clock, which okay. we can talk about. So, so. optical clock, I, I think this is a different thing. So for example, if you are interested in optical clock, actually you only need one cone. But this cone is require very good face lock. So you can see their system. They use the two cavity. This cavity, oh, this cavity is expensive. Okay. So they think one cone is not enough. They most need to lock a cone to a very, very good cavity. Okay. So in this case, I, I think they just buy a commercial cone. It's the, I think usually for now, people prefer use the fiber cone because compared with the titanium sapphire cone, the fiber cone is much compact and much stable. So if you only need to buy a fiber cone, I think uh, $3 million, dollars you can buy it. Million? Million. So do you happen to know that uh, if uh, uh, in a real VI, uh, they are using say Mesa clock? Or, 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 oh, sometimes they depend on different institutes. So I think uh, in this Mesa clock, I think this is depends. So. For example, some of the institute they already have a very good clock. So everyone, all the lab use the same clock. So I think it depends on different institute. They have different methods to do the optical clock or 
the master clock. So it's all, all, also depend on how accuracy you, you are required. So if today you, you buy a... So how about nanosecond? Nanosecond. Nanosecond how much? Nanosecond is not so know. difficult. Should be very easy. Yeah. No. Yeah, because today if you... For example, uh, I think for example, for now the ceasing clock or the Lubidian clock, just your optical frequency cone, you have the repetition rate, you have the carrier frequency, both frequency will you like to the IF generator. And this IF generator will refer to the 10 megahertz reference. And this 10 megahertz reference can be a Lubidian clock. Okay. If you have this system, usually it can provide your accuracy, typically the 10 to the power of minus 12. So this is typical. If you only need such accuracy, then it's much easier and not so expensive. Yeah. But for many applications, when they require such good accuracy, I, I think because they, they want to see some transition particularly for for some forbidden transition because the transition line waves may be only few hertz few mini hertz that's a reason they, they must need to such good stability yeah. so just, just to get, get an idea um the concept of shooting some, a laser to a, a median in central region and you receive something and try to understand something in between. That's something we also do in astronomy. So we usually have a quasar very bright in the sky. And we see this, uh, the, the light pass through the interstellar medium or intergalactic medium. And something got absorbed. You have some absorbing, absorbing features from this quasar. And then we try to understand the median in between. Mm -hmm. So the same idea can be applied actually to astronomy. But your idea of using frequency column is something that I'm trying to think about, whether there's an astronomical light source that can do something similar. Um, so let me ask, when you produce this laser frequency column, do you have, you have to know what frequency do you shoot the lasers and the pulses, is that right? Yes, yes, I, I think you, you, you can think about the frequency column is just the ruler in the frequency domain, so of course we... And you said that up. Yeah, we, we will know the absolute frequency of each cone line. Yeah. Yeah, okay. this we can know. That's why the cone can be a, a very good frequency calibrator, right? Right, so that's something difficult for astronomical position. Because we don't know, we really don't know the nature. We do have lasers, right? Something like lasers. Lasers yeah. from... Yeah, yeah, yeah but... Black but holes. But, but in other sense, if you have some emission which you don't know, you can try to beat with the well now optical frequency cone, then it may give you some information. So it's well now and uh, uh, now, they can go through together. You can try to see the interferon should be different. Oh, you mean the interference? Yes, yes. You use interference to try to figure out the nature of the main source. I think some people are, are, are using this way. Right. Yeah. Be, because, for example, you, you just have a, a unknown emission and you can do the beating with the optical frequency cone. Mm. So here is your like, like a sample. And you also can, can have the cone beating with another cone. Here's the reference. Or oh, some people can have the reference cell in the lab and they can also do the field measurement. So I think this is possible. This is possible. Oh. Okay, I feel something's missing there, but it seems like uh, the concept might be maybe applicable. I think the resolution will be too high for most astronomical application if we want to mix astronomical light source with a laser cone. But what's really useful here is, like what she mentioned earlier, using this as a calibrator that's highly precise and highly stable. For example, you, if you want to discover 
uh, Earth around a distant star. That Earth orbit the star at the rate of several centimeters per second. It's very slow. You need that kind of frequency resolution too. And then second, you need to observe it today, next month, three months later, to see the Doppler shift of the line. So your system has to be both high resolution and stable across time. Otherwise, you cannot compare the spectrum you get and the spectrum you get three months later. Mm -hmm. So you need this kind of highly stable, high precision calibrator. Mm -hmm. And of course, another application is to do lab measurement of chemistry. The question is just whether the density in the lab can be low enough to mimic what we have in space. But another question is in the space. Uh, so, for example, in that kind of the environment. So, what kind of the topic you are interested in? You want to see the species. They they will they will change on time. So, for example, they have have also have some chemical reaction, right? So, the density if the density is a little bit higher then it is possible to use in higher density and the measure the rate constant, then we can those those can be a reference information, then we can have such information then do the simulation in the space condition. I, I think this will also be possible because I think in the space usually the temperature is very low. So of course we, we will think about maybe the relation will be temperature dependent. So, of course, we may not able to do a super low temperature, but we can do the temperature dependent measurement around the te real temperature, right? Or plus minus 50 degree, but uh, those things may have, uh, have some improvement because we can combine with the theoretical operation. Then eventually, those, both of the uh, database and the uh, preparation should be helped to sim simulate the condition in the real space. So this is my my idea of that. So, so the ex experiments you have right now are all room temperature for the Yeah, yeah for, for all of all the experiments are in the real temperature. But I, I know some people they are working on the super cold environment like a few Kelvin may just use in the iron chair or the uh, molecular beam to do such experiments. Of course uh Duco also can combine with such a yes. system but then it just means if we work we really want to study such low density it's also will face as you mentioned they all have a, some limitation for the number density we must think about should we have some good idea to improve the sensitivity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a limitation on the distance between the two detectors? The, shoot, the laser shoot and you have the receiver. Yeah, Is so... Is there a distance limitation? So sometimes, for, for now, we are using a multi-pass cell. So it means the, the probing can continue, go, go through the cell like a 60 time. So another thing is we can also try to couple the laser to the cavity. So for the, if we use the cavity enhancement, then you can think about the total optical path can go to like a hundred kilometer. So with such longer kilometer, it means we can improve the sensitivity. Maybe compared with our current result, we can improve like a two to three order of magnitude, much better. Yeah. So I was thinking about if you can shoot two satellites, mm -hmm. and one shooting the laser, one receiving the laser, and you can study the atmosphere in between the two satellites. Mm -hmm. I don't know, would that be possible? I think it's possible. Would that be an interesting question to answer? <laughs> you get the atmosphere composition and upper atmosphere for the there's low orbit satellites. I see this is possible because now you can see because now you can see here is uh, people doing an experiment in the border. 
they, they put a needle in the capital and then they just shot a line to the capital and then they have a GPS control so you can do a, a wide range the remote sensing in for, for major like a carbon dioxide methane or water some important trace gas in our atmosphere so it, it can work I, I think I in a space I think it would be possible and then it, because the optical frequency cone is very stable so if you have uh, you just put uh, the optical frequency cone into satellite maybe I, I think some people want to use this way to to see uh, some I would say we can do it on Mars yeah I think possible. ground and station the atmosphere and study the atmosphere in planets. I think it's part of it because they, they, they already send the optical frequency code to the space. So it seems the even even for the remote control in the space, the optical frequency code can still be very stable and uh, working very well. So I think in the future should be should be. Although in Taiwan maybe a little bit difficult because <laughs> you you need to send very expensive equipment to the space. So, but in Europe or in US, I think the government put a lot of money on kind of applications. But recently, this space organization just got turned into this TASA. Mm -hmm. Taiwan is from I don't know, but NASA the TASA. I mean, it's okay. got moved to like a national synchrotron. Radiation center level, so it's government seems to be supporting space programs. Okay. Um, I don't know whether accepting the scientific experiments though. Okay. This way they are. They are. Yeah, so I don't know, maybe this could be some interesting applications yeah. for them to consider. Yeah. Um. All right, I think this is a good point to stop. For those who are interested in this topic, we can stay and enjoy coffee outside and continue to discuss yeah. with Dr. Lo. Uh, let's thank Dr. Lo again.